Thank Hello. you so much for joining us a second time. You are, I think, I, do, I, I need to double check this, but I think you are the only person that's come on a second time. We're one of the only people. We don't have a lot of people that we invite on again, but the podcast last year, or one and a half years ago, was so successful. So to anyone that's also new and doesn't know you, why don't you just introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm Joris. I'm uh, Joris Dalen. I'm a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging. And my research is focused on two main themes. So the first one is biomarkers of aging, um, where we try to identify substances, for example, in the blood, that are predictive of how healthy a person is and how long they can live, potentially. And the second thing on the genetics of aging, where we try to find genetic variants in very long-lived individuals and see how they can functionally influence uh, the lifespan and health span of these people. Yeah, so I want to start off by talking about your research. Um, I think in the last podcast, we talked a lot about the environment and what people can do, but I really want to spend some time talking about your research again and also the progress that you've made over the last one and a half years. Maybe like there's, yeah, you can start by just talking about what particular genes you've studied or something in the genetics of centenarians that you found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the research uh, that I'm currently doing is based already on, on what I started in my PhD. So um, when I started my PhD, we got interested in studying the genetics of these very long-lived individuals. And these are individuals that are normally above 90 years of age or even centenarians above 100 years of age. And what we try to do is see, okay, do these long-lived individuals have something in common in their DNA that is shared between most of them that can explain why they are so long-lived. So you can do this so-called genetic association studies, which are these big studies where you study thousands of individuals at once. So we did that for a long time. We did multiple of these studies, but they were not so successful. So we couldn't identify many genetic variants that could explain why these people are so long-lived or why they are protected. But so here, when you diseases. study a thousand people, were they all centenarians? Yeah. So in this case, it would so the, the largest one, which was the last one, we had twelve thousand individuals that belonged in this case to the ten percent longest lived of their birth cohort, and then also it was gender specific. So most of this is above ninety years of mm. age at least, and a lot of them were also above hundred years. And then we compare them to younger controls. And there's always a problem there that arises, namely that the controls that are ideal for this population would be the people that were living in the same environment and that died, yeah. but you don't have their data. Yeah. So we use kind of a younger generation, but then we, we restrict ourselves to people that are below a certain age. And of course, some of them will still have the potential to become long-lived, but it's less likely that it's genetically determined. So we did that in these large studies, but we, like I said, we were not so successful. So we then decided to change the approach. And instead of looking at this uh, so-called common variant, so these are variants that are normally present in, say, 5% of the population or more, we started to look at rare genetic variants. So variants that are very, have a very low frequency. And in this case, we went even further. And we are studying now variants that are really unique to long-lived okay. individuals. So for this, we take these long-lived families. And the reason that we take families is that it's very likely that the genetic component in in there is a bit bigger than in, in normal yeah. long-lived people because yeah, we, we discussed last time as well there are many ways in which you can become long-lived a lot of it is environment but we we really want to study the genetic component um, so that's why we then focus on these long-lived families and we look for variants that have been seen in these families and then normally only in one family and not in the general population and these variants that we then identify we need to functional study because we can never associate them with the trait. So if you identify them in such a low frequency, you can never prove that they are causal um, yeah. for, the, um, uh, for the lifespan or health span of these people. Especially if you only identify it in one family. Exactly. So what we do is, is we focus in this case on pathways uh, that were known for model organisms. So um, we focus a lot on insulin and mTOR signaling, which is something that I think we touched up on. We, we definitely touched up on them. Yeah. I do want to talk about mTOR later yeah. on. Yeah. So, so but this is kind of the, the pathway that in model organisms has been the most, has the most evidence that it's really doing something with lifespan and potentially with health span. So what we do, we focus specifically on this pathway, look at genetic variants within this pathway. We then identified several ones in different genes. And then those we follow up functionally. Mm. I cannot share which genes because uh, then, of course, yeah. uh, 
we 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 can be scooped, but and in, in you can we can I can say it's all in the insulin signaling. So then once we have identified these variants, the next step is to bring them into cells. So we actually use CRISPR to um, to make cell lines harboring these specific variants, and then we look how these variants functionally alter the uh, the cell. So are they influencing first of all the pathway by itself, so insulin signaling? Mm -hmm. Are they um, influencing the general health of the cell? Um, and how are they also affecting, of course, the protein itself? And, and more general, we do proteomics and RNA sequencing to find out kind of what's happening. Um, we identify some nice things there. So we have several variants that show something functional and we brought them into the mouse now. So um, after we have created the cell lines, we also created this, uh, my, mice lines with the same variant. So we created already several mouse lines, harboring some of these variants in insulin signaling. And now we are, characterizing these mouse lines to see if they are uh, living longer, first of all, which is of course a, a main outcome you can study quite easily, although it takes very yeah. long, uh, but also if they are more healthier. And this is more important for us. So it's not so important that they live longer. It would be great if they would live longer, but for us also this, this health is very important because health span um, is, is more informative, I would say, as a readout than, than lifespan in this case. So. This is what we are doing now. We are in the first round of phenotyping um, for one of these variants. We have some interesting findings where it seems that at least the variants do something in these yeah. in these mice, um, and we now have to see how that develops over time. Mm -hmm. But um, this is kind of the research, the main focus of my research, and also um, yeah, where I recently got this this ERC grant for to really expand this part of my research. So are there some variants or specific genes um, that are present in like a lot of different long-lived individuals? Uh, for example, one mm -hmm. of them would be like APOE2. Yeah, we so briefly mentioned that before, but then you also said like you weren't really, we didn't really know if that was really a longevity gene. Yeah, so, 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 from, so what I talked about before, this common variant, their APOE pops up. So what we know about APOE is if you have APOE4, you see an decreased frequency in long-lived people. And if you have EPOE2, you see increased frequency in long-lived people. And we know that these variants are potentially functional because they, are, they have al already been researched a lot yeah. for Alzheimer's disease, for cardiovascular disease. And it's very clear that you have these variants, they have a functional effect on the function of the protein. However, these variants are not unique for long-lived people. So there are yeah. actually quite some people in the general population that would also carry E2. And there are still a lot of long-lived people that still carry E4. So although it can help to protect you, it's not said that, or um, it can be deleterious for you, it's not said that if you have these variants that happens. And this is always a problem with these large genetic studies that it's often not possible to identify really the cause of variants. Mm. And there are many factors that can influence it. But with these variants, at least with APOE, these are kind of the, the, the by, by far the strongest variants associated with, um, with longevity, it's clear that they are involved and that it's good to have an E2 allele and bad to have an E4 allele. Um, but still, you can, like I said, you can have it or not have it and still become very long-lived. Um, yeah. So it could also be that, for example, the long-lived people that have E4 have something else that protects them against this deleterious effect. So, um, and, and that's where we think that it's, also more in the rare variants because like I said, APOE pops up, but that's the only thing. And if you do a similar kind of study for another trait, say cardiovascular disease, you would have uh, hundreds of loci popping up uh, with the same power. So the same sample size, you would get much more. So it's very clear that for longevity, it's different. And that also makes sense because uh, like we discussed before also with the environment, there's so many ways in which you can, we can become long lived that um, each genetic variant you can on paper argue that it would be good or bad for you for for lifespan um, so and that's also what we see we see that there's probably not so many shared variants um, and they could even be in different genes but as long as the downstream readout is the same in the sense for example you can have all kind of variants that influence the pathway in different ways but if the readout at the end is the same that's what we are now looking for, the, the, mm -hmm. the mechanism at the end that explains why all these different variants lead to the longevity. Yeah, even though with centenarians I find it curious because I think if we have like just a pool of people, mm -hmm. just random people, 
if we just look at the people living until the age of 80, I feel like environment makes a huge difference. Yes. We discussed last time 80% is the environment, 20% is genetics. Yeah. But then if we look at those people that live until the age of 100, then I feel like environment doesn't play a big role anymore. Like the, if you just compare people that live until 80 and then until 100, the people that live until the 100, they might not have the best lifestyle. I feel like the genetic component is a lot more important. Yeah, that's also what we think. We, it, we think that the older you get, the more important genetic becomes. There are not, not very good studies on that, but the reason that we just do not have enough power to, to show yeah. that. But there have been some studies which indeed show that the higher you get with age, the more uh, genetically driven it's, it is likely. However, don't forget that also with centenarians, it can still be environmentally driven. For example, if you look at Okinawa, and some of the other blue zones in the world, I don't know if we touched upon it last time, um, where you have these places where there's a lot of long-lived people together and also a lot of centenarians, that's very clearly that it's the environment, potentially in combination with the genetics, mm. that determines why these people live so long, because they live in this healthy environment. So even centenarians um, can be, have become, some of them have become centenarians, I would say, predominantly by their environment. Okay. Um, so it's not said that everybody that becomes centenarian, it's more genetically driven. We think it's more than in 80 year olds, yeah. but still, and you can still become very long lived because of the environment. And this is also the reason that we try really to, to go to this really extremes, for example, with the families where there are multiple people that are long lived, so that it's more likely that it's genetically determined or even more extreme um, long lived people to, to look for the genetics now. So. And that's why we went for this 10%, for example, but we think that's not, not sufficient. We think that we need to go to the 10% that also, for example, have a parent or even a grandparent that belong to this 10% longest lived. And then um, uh, find really the genetic component. I'm yeah. curious about these families. Mm -hmm. Specifically, also, if we look at these families, we can assume that they have a very similar genetics. Um, if one of them dies early, let's say at the age of 70, is it more likely that it's because they are missing a certain good gene, let's call it, or they have a gene mutation, or is it more likely that it's because of their bad lifestyle? Yeah, this is a good question that is, that is very hard to, to figure out. Mm -hmm. So if you were be in the same family, you would assume that if it's a genetic trait and it's, it's coming from the generation above, that for example, 50% of the people in the family will share it. So some of the people will have this genetic variation, some will not have it. So these people that d do not have it might die like normal people, while the ones that have it might survive longer. Um, so it's always very hard to, to determine that. And also, it could still be that you carry a protective variant, but you die. I mean, there are many ways yeah. in which you can die, which can be environmentally driven. Um, it can be, for example, that a specific variant is only protective in a certain environment so that this person that died earlier they they ate something unhealthy continuously and that led to them dying it could be yeah completely um, environmentally driven things like an accident or whatever that they that they hurt themselves and, and die of that um, so this is the thing it's it's a very difficult trade to study because there's so many ways in which you can die um, let's put it like that uh, <laughs> that it's hard to figure out um, what is really the cause and, and, and what is just the consequence. So we, we also see that we, when we look at these very long-lived people, they come from these long-lived families, but still there are people in those families that never made it to that age. Yeah. So there, there, it's not said that if you come from such a family, you will always live long. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's more likely the environment then. It's more likely that these people then died of the environment or yeah. that they didn't carry the specific genetic exactly. variation that protected them. Yeah. And if we, if we just look at people, so in these families, for example, do we see a cor correlation or maybe even with centenarians, just people that live until 100, um, do we see a correlation between healthy lifestyle and longevity? So what we see in general in these, in these people is that they are protected against diseases. Um, so we know that when we look at disease frequencies and things, they are have lower disease frequencies than the general population. You can also see that generations below. So the offspring of very long-lived people from families also are normally protected against age-related diseases. How much of this is environment? How much of this is genetics? Is always the question because you have also the shared environmental effects. And if you do, for example, twin studies, 
you can always try to deduct okay which part is genetics mm -hmm. which part is environment we don't have the power to do that and we that there are some studies that have been going into this direction and they actually show that it's part of it is likely also an environmental component where these people ate very healthy or uh, did more exercise but in general i would say that's not the explanation why these family the most yeah, of these families like we can't more. biohack our way to the no. age of 100 no i don't i mean well i mean i think we can get further than we do at the moment because we actually living quite unhealthy at the moment as in the general population you see that we get this uh, obesity pandemic at the moment you see that now actually lifespan starts for the first time decreasing in the u.s which which is mainly because we we changed our environment in a bad way i would say so i think we can still gain some years at the end of life healthy years but reaching an age of 100 um, that is a bit more uh, special so i think there with just environmental factors i'm not sure if you would be able to reach it you might need something on top which could be your genetics or which could be maybe using specific kind of drugs that help you with it but mm. um but living to an uh, say 90 years or maybe even uh, 95 nowadays you could reach already maybe with with just changing your dietary habits and your uh, your exercise regime um, and definitely some of these diseases in old age you can prevent with this kind of thing so you can like we discussed last time there's a lot you can do which makes you would make you live healthier for longer but reaching this extreme old ages that is most likely at the moment still only for these people that have something in their genetics yeah exactly yeah. um but i guess they, they're just really hard to study and i always have a feeling like you just don't have enough people to really study exactly to kind of reach some conclusions that you can be like it's definitely this specific gene yeah so that's what we with, like i said that's what we really tried and yeah. with this twelve thousand people we had in the study that with, at that time kind of we collaborated with everybody across the world that had genetic data on very long-lived people i still think that we are um, biased in a way that we mostly do this in europeans and in in nowadays chinese individuals because the data is there so uh, some populations are completely understudied although they could have more uh, very long-lived people there uh, like for example um, africa or um, um, central america south america these are underrepresented in genetic studies so we always look into Europeans but in the Europeans where it's very clearly recorded how long people live we went as big as we could and still there will be more people mm. coming but it will not help us and this is the approach that, that we were hoping would be successful but we see that it's probably not the way to go and that's why we went for this rare variance but then like we discussed it's it's much 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 harder to prove uh, causality and show yeah. that this could be something that explains why these people live so long it also seems like there's not one particular longevity gene no like there's no. multiple ones and i don't know if there's also like a synergism between them like it's like if you have one one and three it's not as good as if you have one and two and then they work together or something like that you that's know? that's very likely that we we, we have these so-called epistatic effects but also again there we don't have the power to, yeah. to study them which is very is really a pity but so i believe that it's First of all, it's indeed this, this more rare variants, but also the combination of variants could be very important. But uh, to prove that and show that we, we at the moment just don't, we cannot do it, which is, which is really a pity. So we have to see how far we can come with the research I'm doing now. And hopefully this will at least shed some light on some shared mechanisms between these people. So the different variants resulting in the same downstream mechanism at least. Um, but then it's still at the moment we focus on the insulin signaling which is only part of the big picture mm -hmm. and we need to to look much broader and ideally do this in an unbiased way but this is very difficult so because these long-lived people carry many different rare variants how do you select which one you want to study which yeah. one is very difficult um since we are so limited with the way we can do research um in centenarians do you know how in the future it's research is going to change well, uh, this is this is also again a good question. We we really don't know what to do there. So do you have these people in the field that say, okay, we just should get more of these long-lived people. Um, I don't think that will be that will do the trick. I think we need to really more be more specific about the actual phenotype we are studying. Mm. So we ne really need to start looking for these long-lived people coming from long-lived families, where there's in multiple generations. Uh, 
uh, there have been long lived people in the family and then go down to the people that are that are still alive from those families and take those for the genetic research we have to see how far we can get power wise but i think that's where the strongest genetic component is i don't think it will work by just taking new centenarians because most of these centenarians nowadays have become also became older because of non-genetic effects because we know that our lifespan has been increasing which means that we get more and more people that are over 90 years over 100 years um, and most of them it would still likely be a non-genetic component um, so i think we need to really try to get to a better phenotype of what do we consider heritable longevity and study that to find out the genetic component but still again the majority of the things is um, are environmentally driven so it's also very important that we keep studying the environment um, yeah, yeah. or the, the interaction between the environment and the genetics is there this might be too sci-fi but is there a way that we can predict how old people are going to live at a young age so that mm -hmm. then we know these are the people we need to study at the moment this is this is not yet possible you can you can what you can do is nowadays what people are doing is calculate this polygenic risk scores so you can for every disease that you study you can determine which genetic variants are associated with this disease and then you can make a score out of it and you can say, okay, you have this kind of risk of developing this kind of disease. So that's what people are doing now. So they take individuals, calculate all these risk scores for all these diseases and then say, okay, you have a decreased risk of developing this disease and increased risk of that. So based on that, you can at least predict a bit which individuals have an increased mm -hmm. or decreased risk of, of dying from a certain disease. And maybe then you can find some people that are very healthy but I think the only way really is to look into previous generations and really find out, okay, have these people something in their genes in the family that has helped this family live already for longer? Just take a random people on the street and then just doing polygenic risk scores to predict how long they would live. I, d I don't, well, we're definitely not there yet. Um, I don't know if we will ever get there because like I said, there are so many factors that can determine how long you live. So you can be protected from, from nine out of 10 diseases, but the 10 disease is the one that kills you earlier in the end. Yeah. So it's very hard to, to predict which people will actually manage to survive. And there are actually also, you should know quite some long lived people that had certain diseases and sometimes survived them. So you had, you have, we had also in the, our studies, some people that survived cancer, but still became very long lived. So it, it's not always said yeah. that you have to really um, not get a disease it's also how you deal with the disease and, and, and how you recover from it so it's it's very hard to um, predict which people will become long-lived I mean this mm. would be great I know it would be if right. we could it would do solve it. Yeah. all your problems this this is what we are uh, this is also kind of where the where the biomarker research fits in a bit because we really try to find these markers that could predict how healthy somebody is how long they could live and then potentially use that in genetic yeah. research but we are not there yet. What about epigenetic clocks? It's like the Hor Horvath mm -hmm, clock. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how good is it? How predictive is it? How does it even work actually? Because I don't mm -hmm. actually know how it works. So, so uh, how, it, how it was or originally designed, the first generation clock. So what, what Steve Horvath did at that time is that he took the blood from individuals, um, did this uh, analysis of the epigenetics with these specific arrays, and then looked, okay, how good can I predict the chronological age of a person using this epigenetic profile and then it turns out that that can be done very accurately so he can predict with uh, an r square of more than 0 0.9 which is very very accurate so what you can do is you can use the epigenetics to predict how old somebody is and then you get this this line and then the people that are exactly on the line their chronological age matches with the epigenetic yeah. age so they are as you would expect and then the interesting thing is of course to look at the people where that doesn't work so the people that have a younger epigenetic age or a higher epigenetic age and that would say okay these people are potentially epigenetically older or younger and then the, the question was okay what does this deviation from this line so if they are better or worse say about their health and it turns out that that predicts um, pretty nicely some outcomes like mortality or or specific diseases however it was not perfect so then they then the, the second generation clocks came 
And instead of looking now at the predicting uh, chronological age, they use other kind of outcomes like mortality. And they build different kind of clocks. Some of the most famous one is Grim Age, which is mortality based. And then you can see, you can do the same trick. So you have these people that have a specific um, epigenetic profile for this Grim Age clock. And that is predictive for mortality or for uh, morbidity. So it works pretty well in the sense that these clocks can be used to predict these kind of outcomes. However, um, we think that we should combine them differently in the sense mm -hmm. that a lot of focus has been on the epigenetics. I've worked a lot on the metabolomics where we do the same trick. And we actually see also in the metabolomics that if you make these clocks or predictors, I would call them, based on heart outcomes like uh, morbidity or mortality, they are much better in predicting in general uh, general health than the ones that are based on age. Um, and that we also see is that they are probably doing the same trick as the epigenetics, but differently. So they can both uh, have an effect on mortality, for example, but they can, if you combine them together, it will be even stronger. Yeah. So instead of focusing on just one of these markers, like a lot of people in the field do, they just, just focus on epigenetics, just focus on proteomics, uh, or metabolomics, we, I think we should combine everything and really come up with these better predictors across different kind of measurements, combine them and see how, how, the, how well that works. Um, but the ID, I mean the original ID of Horvat, really changed the field in, in, in how we do this. And um, I mean, we are not a big fan. Um, I mean, my group and also other groups are not really a big fan of this chronological age clock, like I said, because they predict just chronological age this is not a very informative outcome we should go for the more but also generation. like i always ask myself like if my if through the horvath clock it predicts that i'm 21 yes. instead of 25 yeah like how does it actually know that my body is how do we know that my body's actually functioning as a 21 year old let's yeah this say, is all mm -hmm. this is a good point so i mean how it's coupled to biology is, is another thing so i mean this you could make this very accurate predictors but the problem also with epigenetic clocks was for a long time, how does this uh, work in, in biologically? The, because the, the sites that were selected for these epigenetic clocks are kind of random. And if you look for enrichment in these sites or what they do biologically, there was not so much that you can find. And this is a problem, right? How can yeah. you, so you, you can say you're 21 years old epigenetically. So what does it mean biologically? And is it really saying something about how healthy you are? Because it just says, that your blood epigenetic profile is younger, but it doesn't say anything about yeah. other kind of markers. And it could still be that you're unhealthy in, in aspects that are not covered by the clock. So it's just a way of figuring out, okay, am I, am I younger than expected based on, on epigenetics or, uh, or metabolomics or proteomics, but then coupling that to real heart outcomes has been uh, a, a challenge. And we have people in the field that, that say, okay, we should already start using these epigenetic clocks now um, to really use them in clinical studies and show um, that if somebody is biologic or epigenetically younger, that will say that our treatment works or not. Um, but I think we, we need to take a step back and now first start looking in the clinic. And that's what I'm trying to do here as well in Cologne. See, can these predictors actually be used in the clinic? And the parameters that are already used in the clinic now how do they compare with this more biological uh, estimators? Like uh, in my case, I'm looking at metabolomics, but I'm also interested in this epigenetics. So, so are they better predictors than the predictors that are already out there in the clinic based on uh, more health and functioning of, of participants um, in these studies? Or do, they, um, or do they say the same or are they saying something different and should they, they should be maybe combined? Um, and this is what I'm trying to figure out. And before we are at that stage, I think we shouldn't use them already to say if somebody's healthy or not. And this is a bit the, the, the tricky thing in the field I feel now, is that some people really think that these epigenetic clocks have predictive power. Um, and that, so that if you do an intervention and your epigenetic clock goes down, that that means the intervention is healthy. But like I said, we are not there yet. Mm. So it will take some time before we at that stage. I don't say it's not true. It's just I don't think we have enough evidence to, to support this. Uh. Yeah, at least it can be used as a tool potentially in the future. And yes. In the end, you always want to be developing and yeah. tools. So 
yeah, we'll see how it can get used in the future. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think what, what Steve found in his first paper and, and what came afterwards really, like I said, transformed the field in, in how we should look at biomarkers. But I feel that there's a lot of hype also surrounding it and we should maybe do take it a bit slower and really now systematically start testing all these uh, markers in clinical studies to see how much they can actually add. Yeah. yeah. I also realized I never actually asked you, like in, in ourselves, what is it about us that kind of like, tells us that we're aging? Like what happens? Is it that, I don't know, like we have bad genes or is it something in our genome? Like what is it actually? Yeah, that's a good question, which I think if you ask different people in the field, they give a different answer. Okay. So we actually did a survey also among the people that are working in our field and there's really no consensus. So there's no consensus about what is aging. Um, yeah. E exactly. I mean, what is what is quite clear is that most people think it's indeed over time your body uh, gets damaged, kind of in yeah. different. It can be different ways, and that builds up, and that in the end leads to this occurrence of many different diseases um, or age-related traits. But how it happens and the processes that are responsible for it, it's not really clear. And uh, how much of it is, for example, genetically driven, um, evolutionary um, explanations for it. There's a lot of debate about it and, and, okay. and how aging actually occurred because there can be, it can be, is it an evolutionary side effect kind of because we really invest in reproduction and aging. We never selected ourselves to, to be healthy, to age healthily or is it, um, is it, Program. There's also a lot of discussion about okay. that. Is, 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 is aging programmed, which I think the majority of the people in the field will, will disagree with. Yeah. Um, but the real process of aging and also when it starts is very much under debate. Do, does aging start the moment um, the egg is fertilized? Does it start in young adulthood? Does it start when you are 50 years of age? I would have always thought aging starts when you stop growing. Yeah, but uh, there's but a lot of debate now also in the field and also, for example, people try to show that with the epigenetic clock, the moment you, you fertilize the egg and it starts there, then already yeah. the process of deterioration aging okay. would start. So there's, yeah, so it's not that you have to, that you have to become an adult before aging starts occurring. Already during um, development, there are some things that you could consider aging and yeah. that is why it also where there's also this debate because it's, some people say it's, it's, it starts young, some people say it starts older, and they study it therefore differently. Um, I don't think it's a big concern because people can have different ideas of what aging is as long as we agree on how to study it. And um, I think that is, there's more consensus on that. So not on what aging is, but more on how to study it. So um, when we, like when we're older, there's higher chances of us developing cancer, Alzheimer's, all these kind of diseases. Is it because cumulatively, it's like a cumulative effect that we just, our DNA gets damaged more and more and more. And then when we're at an older age, it's so damaged that we have a higher risk of these diseases. Or is it that when we're younger, we always damage our DNA, but our body can repair it. And it's just when we get older, we just don't have this ability to repair the DNA anymore. And that's why we develop these uh, age-related diseases. Yeah, that's a good point. There, there, there are many theories of, of, of how it occurs. One is indeed that your body becomes less functional in repairing things and, and uh, repairing damage, but also reacting to stimuli. Um, so your body starts functioning less and could therefore react less on, on environmental influences that have. On the other hand, there it's also known that with age, you just get more DNA damage. So it could also be in some cases that just the buildup of the amount of damage that has occurred in the end leads to the, to okay. the disease. Um, so I think there's different ways of, of, of getting there. And this is also where you have this different, uh, hall, we call them hallmarks of aging, which may not be the, the best term to use. Um, if we you went know. through them in yes. detail last time. We will yeah. not do that no, again. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, this is, the, 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 these are all different kind of ways in which aging could occur. But I mean, DNA damage is one of the ones that is, very big in our field as, 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 as a potential uh, mechanism by which we could age. But the, the, the difficulty there is always, okay, we, we have this evidence that if you 
manipulate the DNA damage that animals will live shorter but it's hard to prove that if you increase repair for example that individuals live longer mm. this evidence is, is not really there yet so we really don't know how much is really cause and consequence of aging and uh, but DNA repair definitely plays a role and it's clear that DNA repair ability reduces over time uh, when you get older so you will be getting uh, worse at repairing your mistakes that uh, that are made in your DNA. Yeah. And what is the difference between a healthy let's say 30 year old versus a healthy 70 year old because Mm -hmm. They're not equally as healthy. We know that. So, kind of, what is the what is the difference just from their biology speaking? Well, it depends on what you consider health. So, yeah. I mean, um, they might still have, for example, the same way of which they react to a specific kind of environmental factors. It could still be that they have the same number of mutations in their DNA. So, it's really hard to to say what is healthy and what's non healthy. If you look in a 70 year old and compared to a 30 year old um, and you would base health on diseases most likely yeah. this 30 year old has less diseases and less kind of damage in its body um, and therefore people would say okay this person might be more healthy than a person that's 70 years of age because for example they have cartilage damage that happens over time you have some of these things that we know happen anyway um, during normal aging um, which you could say lead to unhealthy things, but in the end are not directly affecting the health of the people. Um, but it's, it's very, very hard to say what is a difference if you consider health at 70 or 30. I would say you should help, you should determine health more generally, and it should be independent of your age. Um, so in principle, a 70 year old would always be, likely always be more unhealthy than a 30 year old because they have been okay. aging uh, but if you look at outcomes it might still be that it's considered healthy at 70 year old because it has less diseases than an other 70 year old but that it has less diseases than a 30 year old will be more unlikely it will be unlikely there are some people where you can see that they are probably 50 years or even 30 years of age which would be very extreme when they are 70 years of age. So they have the health profile of mm -hmm. a person that's 30 years of age. But for most people, they have a profile that is considered a bit more unhealthy than um, than a 30 year old. So this is really a hard question to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to answer in that way. It's, um, it's funny because we're talking a lot about what's healthy and what's unhealthy. And this is what makes me curious about this 80-20 rule that not 80-20 rule, but like the 80% environment, 20% mm -hmm. genetics is mm -hmm. what determines our health slash lifespan. But like, how do we know what's actually healthy for us? And surely yeah. our opinion on that changes regularly. So do we then also update kind of the calculations that we've done for the 80-20 ratio? So it's a very good point to need what is considered healthy. Because for example, if you have um, a bit higher BMI or you are a bit your cholesterol is a bit um, unhealthy if you compare it to a normal young pe person that might actually be healthy for you at old age exactly so for example yeah. a yeah. higher blood pressure as well it's it's known that a high blood pressure is bad for you when you're younger but it might be good for you when you're older so there's always this this balance kind of what is good at which age and it could indeed be that something could be bad for you young but good for you later or the other way around. So it's, it's very hard to figure out what is exactly good for you at which age. But we know that there are these factors that switch and, and blood pressure is, uh, is one of them and, and cholesterol another one where it's very clear that if you become 85, year, uh, 85 years of age, for example, then above that age, it becomes protective to have it. And probably what happens is this people manage to survive already for this long with this blood pressure so they have something that protect them against this fact that it's a bit higher but then when they are older it becomes actually better because it the blood can still reach the brain but people that have a low blood pressure at one point that becomes a problem and they then suffer from the fact that they always had low blood pressure because they can their body can no longer uh, make up for that that's fascinating so. 
I always thought like there must be a line where kind of some things are healthy when you're younger and then it, there's a switch. Yeah, where the exact line is, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's probably yes. also like a gray zone. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, there's probably not like, okay, at the age of 40, that's when you turn 40, yeah. you have to do this. Um, but so what kind of things then do we know are healthy? So you've mentioned blood pressure, for example. Yeah, so the other one is, is, is um, um, cholesterol, where it's also clear that, uh, of course, a high cholesterol, it depends on the type. So are, yeah, are we talking about HDL or uh, LDL? Yes, or triglycerides in this case as well, where it's, 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 it's detrimental for you when you're younger, yeah. but it becomes beneficial for you when you're older. Another thing is- High, you, high triglyceride level? Yes, okay. yes. Another thing is, um, I have to check if it's correct in the high, but I think it's high, um, high triglycerides. I do um, know that high, if you have a high triglyceride, it's bad. Like yeah. It's considered yeah. bad, at least when you're younger. Yes. Yeah, and this <laughs> is, I mean, <laughs> there are not that many studies on it, but the one that, that, that have evidence for it are pretty convincing that that's the case. Another thing is BMI, where, of course, when you're a bit older and you have a bit more BMI, that could be healthy because, for example, when you then get an infection, um, people that have a very low BMI would die early because their body can no longer... Yeah. Um, has not enough reserves to, to target the infection. While if you then a bit more overweight, your body can survive longer under this kind of condition. So in that way, um, we have these factors that protect. There are probably more, um, but we have not ma studied many of those in detail yet, where mm. that's also really this, this shift in, in what happens. And um, for example, I when I was studying um, metabolites, we also kind of, uh, looked into different age ranges how well uh, predict how predictive these specific metabolites were and we also saw there that some of them are really very predictive in young age and become less predictive in old age or mm -hmm. even switch um, while others just remain very constant in in how predictive they are so there are these factors that there where it's across the lifespan always kind of the same and you have these factors where it switches and try this right or are one of the examples where that's the case. Mm. But then do we factor that in when we calculate kind of like how much the environment plays a role in increasing our health span and what is good? Well, this is this is something that happens definitely in the clinic. And I mean, this is something that I also noticed that there is sometimes a bit of a disconnect because what hap with what's happening in the clinic and what, what's happening in studies, for example, in model organisms, because these kind of things are normally not taken into account. Or if you go to the clinic, the clinician will know, okay, at this age, your triglycerides are a bit higher, which is maybe a good thing. So in the clinic, it's already taken into account. And also, they will maybe say in this case, for example, okay, your blood pressure is now a bit low, you're this kind of age, maybe you should try to work on increasing your blood pressure mm -hmm. with environmental factors. So it is known and your clinician will likely say you have to adapt um, your lifestyle also based on where you are in the spectrum of, of age, but also in health um, ba and based on your profile. But it could be that indeed for a younger person with the same clinical profile, they would advise another kind of uh, uh, dietary intervention or an intervention in general than for a person that is uh, much older. Mm -hmm. um, but then, and how specifically have we determined this number that 80%? Um, mm -hmm. of the environment if can help us what or contributes to increasing lifespan and it's only 20% genetics. So this, 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 this estimate comes from these twin studies that were done in the earlier days mm -hmm. and later on also now large pedigree studies where they really looked, okay, what's the heritability of lifespan? So you take twins, you look how long they live okay. and then you can estimate the difference and based on that came the number 20% is likely genetics. Then the big family studies came that are more recent, where they actually show that's probably even less. Mm. So it's, it's maybe even below 10%. Genetics. Yes, but that is just lifespan. And we believe that if we look at these extremes, so this longevity, which we consider an, a different kind of trait, that there the genetic component is at least a bit bigger. How big? We don't know yeah, because yeah. we don't have yeah, yeah. the studies to estimate. So that's where it's coming from. So okay. it's more that it's estimated how much the genetic contribution is and based on that, you can deduct how much, how much the environment, the environment is. is. Yes. Okay, okay. But that, estimating that exactly sense. how much the environment is is normally not done. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, let's talk about drugs because mm -hmm. in the last podcast, you mentioned that there was actually a clinical trial going on 
with metformin? They wanted to start it. Oh, yeah. they wanted to start it. Yes. Have and they started it? Not. They oh. not yet, but they are really close to it. So because there has been come new funding available, so now they finally managed to get all the funding, and now they will actually start the trial. So ex I don't know the exact date when it will start, but it will be very soon, and it will be indeed the first clinical trial yeah. uh, where the drug hopefully helping us to age healthier. Um, and what about rapamycin? Is there a chance that that will also, that some clinical trials will be done? Because I heard that rapamycin is, like it's technically the better or the yes. more potent drug. Yes. Uh, that's the one maybe true. with also more potential. Yes, though that's what we also believe in the field, that, it's, that has, it has uh, likely more potential. Um, so there are now already several small clinical trials um, that get started. So there, because there became much more funding available for aging research, um, especially in the US, people have now really started to, to start small clinical trials in which they indeed start checking the effect of rapamycin, but not yet in a big clinical trial. Um, there's also been this studies on Rapalog, so this uh, compounds that are looking like rapamycin, mm -hmm. so doing kind of the same thing. And uh, they have been tested, for example, on on immunity. So we, we um, vaccinate people and look how their immune response is after an, uh, treatment with these kind of drugs. And they could show in these trials, which were phase two trials, that they, there were actually beneficial effects. However, in the end, the primary outcome was not met. So then people said, okay, the primary outcome is not met, so it, it didn't work. But still, you could see, if you look at other outcomes, that there are beneficial effects. So based on this, people have started also redesigning some of the repologs and there's still a lot of, of work to get them again in other clinical trials to, to, sh to get some proof that they could actually help in, um, in this case, for example, targeting immune related um, aging, but also in aging in general. So people are trying it. Um, one thing that we will probably talk about later is that there's also, for example, a clinical not really a, a clinical trial, but a trial in, in dogs where they start mm -hmm. now with rapamycin. So it's um, it's high on the priority list in the field, I would say, to get rapamycin in clinical studies to see how beneficial it could be. Uh, because based on model organism research, it's probably the, the number one candidate that we should yeah. study. So um, yeah, people are very excited to see if we can get it in the clinic. How um, do they work? How does metformin work? How does rapamycin work? Surely they have different mechanisms. Yes, so metformin is, is used already as a, a anti-diabetes medication. So the reason they went ahead with that is that they know it helps in targeting diabetes. So it, it, it targets all the specific processes that are involved in diabetes. Um, it's, it's known to um, be targeting this AMPK pathway. I, I, I don't know the exact details. I cannot. No, no. It's but uh, okay. in general, it's, it's, it's known to to influence that. It also has some effect on mTOR, um, but much much less than, than rapamycin. Because if we took, take rapamycin, it's known that it's targeting mTOR specifically. So you have two mTOR complexes, mTOR1 and mTOR C1 and mTOR C2, and rapamycin is known to really block mTOR C1 and also at the same time influence mTOR C2. But the exact effect of mTOR C2 on mTOR C2 is, is not really clear if it's beneficial or non-beneficial, but it's known that the effect on mTOR C1 is a beneficial effect where you block this one and then the, the downstream signaling also becomes different and that results in, in, in health span benefits. Because calorie restriction, fasting also blocks mTOR exactly. C1. Exactly, that's the same trick. So are then calorie restriction and rapamycin the same? No, right? Like surely no. rapamycin does something else as well that calorie restriction doesn't. I would actually maybe say it's more the opposite. I think calorie yeah. restriction is probably broader. So because rapamycin is really a specific drug. So in the sense that it specifically targets mTOR. If you take caloric restriction, it will target mTOR, but it will probably do more than just that because it's less specific. Yeah. So um, it does the same trick. And this is also why we why the insulin signaling is such a, an interesting pathway to study because that pathway is targeted by different kind of interventions and all resulting in health span benefits like caloric restriction and rapamycin. But there are also other drugs that people are now using to target this pathway and, and get beneficial outcomes in the end. So I think also for caloric restriction, the effect on the mTOR signaling is likely the most important. 
but it will have other effects as well and some of them might actually not be beneficial yeah yeah with calorie restriction i think it's we don't know no um also like the disadvantages that or the harm that it could yeah. do yeah um, it will not be so the thing is also and that's actually with most interventions for some people caloric restriction will be unhealthy so in general you could advise people okay eat less do some caloric restriction but for some people that will not work and may actually have detrimental effects and why that is is we don't know exactly so it might be that the baseline of these people is already in a, in a state where when you would adapt it based on caloric restriction that is that is not good for the body anymore and for some people and that's actually what we think for most interventions if you take the the baseline profile of people and based on that you take the most unhealthy people um, and you start then targeting specifically some of the aspects that are unhealthy in these people that then the 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 um, effects will be biggest in the sense for example you know that somebody has high triglycerides you target specifically triglycerides those people will benefit if you take the normal people which have normal triglycerides you start targeting them they might also have an effect on triglycerides but it will not be beneficial mm -hmm. anymore this is what we actually kind of see now with with most studies that the people that are most unhealthy benefit most yeah. from this intervention yeah, yeah but the people that are already kind of healthy do not seem to respond so much and you see that with exercise as exactly, well exactly exactly oh. with exercise and with caloric restriction yeah could you ever see us take both metformin and rapamycin people are trying that already i mean that it's, it's also there is some evidence i think uh, in model organisms if i remember correctly that shows that if you take the combination of them it might have some synergistic effects um, but there's also other drugs that people are now indeed trying where people are trying to take combinations and see yeah. okay which combinations of drugs uh, might work well and which um, which could be work really synergistically and which one do just the same trick and you shouldn't use at the same time and I mean I can already tell you there are people that are doing this mm -hmm. because many people there are many kind of biohackers or people that follow the field that see which kind of drugs are there and they just take them so I can tell you there there's already people in the field taking both the question is if that's that's healthy or not healthy. Yeah, this is know. actually a funny story. Like I, I traveled to Nepal in 2019, and that's kind of when I started listening to a few podcasts about mm -hmm. aging research. And I went to a pharmacy there and I asked for metformin, just out of curiosity, and they would have sold it to me. Whereas I know, like in Europe, you wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to buy it without a prescription. I didn't buy it. I didn't take it. But I, it was curious that like you, you can get your hands on it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also also on rapamycin, the thing is you can, and then uh, another drug that, uh, alpha, uh, I have to say, al keto alpha glutarate is now also a, a hot uh, drug in our field and you can get it and then people yeah. will do it and people will start taking it. So you have kind of already this population where people um, are taking all these kind of drugs because what they read about it. And um, there's even people in the field, if you would ask them to research themselves, that do it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we don't know how healthy it is and how safe it is. So, mm. I would never advise it. <laughs> so, you clearly don't do it. No, no, no. I don't do it. I mean, this is also a thing. I mean, we preach always what to do to become more healthy, like exercise more and eating less. But it's hard to keep yeah. it also and do it yourself. So, I mean, I try to, to look what I eat I try to have regular exercise at least but I know I could do better yeah. um, and I but I always tell other people to if they want to change it do it but you're yeah doing it yourself is, is, is not always a uh, couple to that I would yeah, say. yeah. Mm, have we also studied or are we gonna study synergistic effects between drugs and maybe certain environment or certain genes that you have because it could be that if you have these genes this drug might be better but then for those genes another drug might be better yeah so this is also the so-called pharmacogenetics so this is a big field especially for uh, for for example cardiovascular research mm. where that's already a big more known which um, which drugs people use like um, statins and then for statins yeah. they can then we can actually check okay if you have this genetic profile this statin will not work we take something else so I think we will go in the same direction that we will determine indeed okay are there specific genetic factors that are influence how well you respond to this kind of drugs but we are not there yet but um, how many years do you think it's going to take well first we have i think the thing is first we have to prove that these drugs will actually benefit healthy aging and once we have that evidence in humans it can go quite quickly because the genetic data is, is easily obtained and you can just see okay which people are the responders 
which people are the non-responders. But before we are there, we need this big clinical trial. So you need thousands of individuals, I, uh, ideally 10,000, 100,000 that, that do it. And then you can start doing this kind of uh, deduction, okay, which genetic variation is influencing it. Because if you just do it in a thousand or a hundred people, you will not be able to yeah. find out um, why, what's the reason that people are responding or non-responding. And it could also indeed be not only genetics, but also indeed environment, that it could be the combination of what people eat with that specific drug or, exactly. or, or, or how much they exercise. It could go in any direction. So, um, yeah. but that will, um, yeah, that will, I would say, not be within the next 10 years, realistically. Mm. Um, mTOR, we mentioned that. Can you quick, it seems to be extremely important. Yes. Turning yeah. off mTOR seems to be like key. Um, so can you talk a little bit about mTOR and why we want to be turning it off? Yeah, so you, you, you have kind of, um, like I said, you have two complexes. You have mTOR1 and mTOR2, and, they think, and, and people think they have different uh, effects in the body. So this complex is built out of different proteins. So you have the mTOR uh, protein itself, which is in both complexes, and you have different proteins in each complex. Some of them are shared, some of them non-shared, and that's probably the reason that they function differently. And if you look downstream, of, of mTORC1. One of the main things that people think is the reason that um, uh, that mTORC reduction is good for you is that it influences autophagy and it influences yeah. S6K. So S6K is, is a direct downstream target where you would see if you um, um, target mTOR that S6K will be going down. And with rapamycin, S6K will be completely blocked. And they think that some of the health benefits come from that part. And that could be related to more downstream even immunity or other kind of things. And then you have the autophagy part. And this is also uh, very clear now also from, from recent research, also from our institute, for example, where it's very clear that this autophagy, targeting this autophagy is, is one of the main reasons that um, mTOR could, could help you uh, live healthier for longer. So um, targeting autophagy may be something that is the that's explaining why it, it works so well. But we don't always want to turn mTOR off, right? No. Like there's Because I know like, it, so high amounts of protein turn mTOR on, but that's good because you need it for pro, like muscle Yeah, synthesis. so it, this, is, this is always indeed a trade-off, right? And this is also with rapamycin, that rapamycin is a very strong inhibitor of mTOR, and we actually think that it's too strong sometimes, so mm -hmm. that you shouldn't continuously take it because shutting it down the whole time is, is also not something healthy. So we... This is also why people are, are creating these wrapper logs and also trying to kind of see, okay, what kind of dosage do you need to use? Because you don't want to shut it down completely. You want to kind of shut it down to a level where it's still beneficial and, and where it can still be turned on in case it needs to be turned on. So this is the thing, these drugs should not be complete blockers. They should probably be regulating it in a way um, that it can still respond, yeah. um, but then in a healthy way. And on a day-to-day -day basis, is it food intake that determines whether mTOR gets turned on or off, or is there something else? Well, food is, is one of the things that indefinitely influences your mTOR, but I think there are many factors that could influence it. Okay. Stress um, as ah. well, um, I think exercise. There are many ways in which you can influence mTOR because insulin signaling is such a central um, pathway in your body that there are, and, and it's regulated in so many different ways, which in the end all come down to mTOR which then goes down so yeah there, there's many different ways in which you can regulate your your mTOR yeah um in terms of fasting so like we talked uh last time about how fasting is good i guess now we've mentioned also it's good to fast to turn off mTOR my biggest problem is from studies about time-restricted eating intermittent mm -hmm. fasting in mm -hmm. mice mm -hmm. because a mouse if they fast for two days they die right we can go like at least a week without eating and we would be fine. So then if mice fast for like eight hours or 16 hours, whatever kind of hours they chose for their intermittent fasting studies, I feel like that's not really representative to humans because mm -hmm. 16 hours in a mouse would be like, I don't know, two weeks for us, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, that's a very good point that it's, it's, it's not really comparable. Another thing is also the time of feeding. I mean, mice eat mostly during the night. They are more yeah. active during the night. While most of the studies do the fasting during uh, the night. So it's, it's kind of also how do you, um, when do you do the fasting? So this is one thing that's now a very big topic in the field as well. So is the fasting itself important 
or is the timing of when you do the fasting more important? And there's kind of now coming more and more papers out that it's also really depending on when you do the fasting, how long you do the fasting, this, all these kind of things um, seem to play a role. And yes, indeed, most of this evidence comes from mice. Yeah. And we now need to start testing it in humans and really actually see, okay, how could it be beneficial to humans? What we know is that definitely caloric restriction um, has health benefits when you do it longer term in, in humans. So there, there's now a two year study on that. But how much fasting is doing is not yet clear. So we think that indeed fasting is something that could benefit you because it could kind of potentially reset your system. Um, after which you can then eat again normally and your system would respond better. Um, but for how long, which timing, this is, this is not known yet. And we can definitely not say, okay, because if we do it this way in the mouse, we should do it exactly the same way in a human. Yeah. There's, we need to have more human studies on it that actually show what is the beneficial time window, um, how many days per week or how many days per month. And this, this is still unclear. But it's known that fasting can, can also be beneficial. For example, if you fast people before certain operation, it will help um, the, uh, with a better outcome of this yeah. kind of operation. So now I know there's also research ongoing where, for example, people that are treated um, um, with chemotherapy, yeah. they are fasted before they start the chemotherapy and then the chemotherapy is more effective. So it's definitely something that people also are playing with um, also in other fields to see how we could use fasting as something um, yeah, to, to help reset our system, yeah. I would say. I guess this brings me to dogs then, and you know, I guess half, m most people study aging in mice, like you yes. do. Yes, <laughs> um, And then I know that some people are trying to study aging um, in dogs, because dogs, you know, have similar environment to humans, also die from similar diseases. Um, yeah, what do you think about that? I think that? it's it's great research that is ongoing. So this was this you have now this dog aging project which is started in the US. Um, they're thinking about expanding it uh, also broader, where they really decide, okay, indeed we start taking dogs um, and just in their natural environment, um, and we see, okay, how are they healthily doing? How long do they live? So they study kind of in general how the dogs are doing. So it's kind of an epidemiological study of dogs. And at the same time, they're also trying to start now doing interventions, and they're doing intervention in some of these dogs. So they have also trials in these dogs where they say, okay, some of these dogs, we will give rapamycin, some of them, we will, we will just keep the, giving their general food and see um, what happens to their health. So I think it's a very nice model organism in the sense that it's genetically diverse and it uh, has indeed similar environmental factors that, that they are food exposed is the to. only thing I guess that's different and I feel like mm -hmm. food in our diet can influence us a lot so yes. I guess that's probably a significant it, it I mean it will problem. never be a one-on-one -on -one yeah, relationship exactly, but, exactly. but some of the diseases um, that are happening in dogs are also happening in humans or actually you may, may want to say the other way around the disease that are happening in humans are also happening in dogs so there's there's a lot of evidence that um, that the biological processes are likely very similar. They will not be exactly the same, and there will still be human-specific processes. But in general, I think we can learn a lot from these studies in dogs. And since dogs live shorter than humans, you can also do more experiments. And you are allowed to do more experiments with dogs as well, ideally in their natural environment, so that you will not um, have to do really clinical trials with them. But um, yeah, I think this direction is, is very interesting. and. The project started a couple of years ago and, and the first big results will probably start coming out soon. So I'm really Well, the problem forward. is dogs do lo live a lot longer than mice. Yes, they so live longer. it will longer. still yeah. take quite a while to get some data. Yes, yes. But also, I mean, what they, will, what they are doing in these dogs is that they are normally not studying them from really young age, like mm. we do in humans. They will not follow them up their whole life. So they actually start really this epidemiological cohort where they just take all the dogs that want to participate in it. So some of these dogs will already be a bit older. I think most of them will actually also be already middle age, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then of course the time before something occurs is shorter. And it's also more realistic in how we study it in humans. And also with interventions, they, the interventions they will not do only in very young dogs and see what happens. They will do them in, in the whole age range um, because we are also interested, okay, if we start some of these interventions much later in life, can they still be beneficial? Mm. Um, 
So it's yes, it takes longer to study them than mice than in mice, but we can study them more like we do with humans. We, there's also now more people doing the same trick in mice where they say, okay, we just age the mice and then we start treating them late in life to see if we still have the same benefits. But it's of course more, um, more, more forced in the sense that you just let them live and do it. And the, and the, the dogs, you just do it whatever mm. you get. So you get yeah. the whole natural variation from the population where, where a lot of dogs will present themselves already with certain diseases and then still you could see, okay, is the drug maybe beneficial or not? And the nice thing about dogs is because I talked quite intensely also with some of these people in this project is that they also have this electronic health record or this health record. So a lot of people that have dogs keep also health records of their dogs. So it is also again very similar to humans. So they can really see how the health of the dogs changes over time. And I think this is, this is very exciting research. If you had the possibility to study aging in dogs, would you choose to do that? Or for your field and exactly what you do, mice are, are I mean, just as good? Yeah, I mean, in my case, I think it's not possible because I make specific genetic mutants. Yeah. To make a gen uh, genetically modified dog, you don't want to do that, especially not before you have evidence, before it's, uh, um, yeah, before we have evidence from lower model organisms. So we need to do this research in, in, in lower model organisms. And I mean, if it would have been possible with the variants that I'm studying, I would have started with worms or flies, but they were not conserved. So the reason I went to the mice is that they are conserved there, they are well characterized model organisms, and I start with those. Um, so this kind of research that I'm doing, the genetic part, I, w I wouldn't do in dogs. The biomarker part, on the other hand, is something that we are also interesting, interested in and we are also starting to collaborate actually with the people in the in this dog aging project to see how we can uh, kind of uh, make the better connection between what is done in dogs and what is done in humans on the biomarker level and see if we can test yeah. things in dogs that we cannot test in humans. So for some of the work, dogs could help, for the genetic work, no. But no dogs are being studied in Europe yet, so this is just an organization in America. Um, well, in the sense, they, they set it up in the United States, they are want to expand, so they, they want to also bring it to Europe and also other parts of the world, but at the moment it's still a US-based study. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see maybe in the next few years. Yes, yes, who knows. <laughs> Another hot topic in the aging field is reprogramming the genome. Yes. Um, we did mention Yamanaka factors last time, but I think it would be good also for anyone that's new and doesn't know what the Yamanaka factors are. Maybe we can explain first what the Yamanaka factors are and then go on to talking about the genome and yeah. reversing it. Yeah, so you have the specific factors, there are four. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know their names by heart, sorry for that. But what you can do is if you give these specific genes um, uh, to your cells or to your organism, then you kind of rejuvenate the cells or ideally rejuvenate the, the organism. So there's been a lot of research into that where they use this in the beginning to say, okay, we have a cell from an individual, we give these four factors to the cell and then we bring it back to this pluripotent state. So they call this induced pluripotent stem cell. So it was used for that to kind of take a cell from an individual, bring it to a young state and then you were able to study it in culture and also reprogram it. So you actually reprogrammed it and then you can study it in whatever way you like. So it was originally, I think, mostly used for that. And then people started to think, okay, can we use it also to maybe reprogram tissues? Or can we reprogram whole organisms? And that has recently been happening, that actually they took mice, for example, gave them these uh, factors, and then they see that they reprogram the mice um, to become more young. How well it worked in vivo, that's still kind of, uh, needs to be tested and especially also in higher organisms, but that kind of boosted the field a lot. And because of that also now we have a big company that was been founded, which is Altos, which really goes into that direction. So they took many of the scientists that were working in this field, brought them into this company, and this company is really gonna see how far can we get with this epigenetic programming. Can we bring it ideally at one point to the humans, or is it something that is working in nicely in, in, organism, in model organisms or in cells, but maybe not at the whole level of, of humans? And there is already some evidence that it, um, you can also do it more tissue specific. So there's this, this famous paper in the field um, of David Sinclair's group where they did epigenetic reprogramming in the eye 
of a mouse and then the mouse that was blind originally get vision again. So it can potentially also be used to restore a specific tissues. And in that paper, they introduce only three of the yes. Yamanaka factors. Yeah, there's also a lot of discussion in the do you need three or four? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of debate, uh, I think also in the field, how many do you need? Do you need all four or just three of them? You can replace some of them with another one. It's this, this I have I don't I have don't have the expertise on that so I cannot give you the details but I know that there is a lot of debate in how many do you actually need um, these three I think everybody always uses at least three but the yeah. fourth one is is kind of uh, the question do you really need it or not yeah because maybe if you have all four then you just bring the, the cells all the way back and then they just they don't know how to act like a brain cell for example or I don't I, yeah I don't know if that was really the problem it, it's I think in that paper the problem was that they saw that the cells were just like they were just dividing uncontrollably yeah. and leading to cancer yeah but yeah so I mean I mean and but then also other people that have done the same trick in the field I know used again this four so there there is a lot yeah. of discussion about should you use three or four um, but at least it's shown that doing this kind of reprogramming can help to um, well the, the eye is, is one thing in the mouse and now they are trying it also for, for different kind of uh, age-related conditions to see if it could help and, and ideally also in the whole organism. So there's this one paper that's also famous in the field where they did it in the whole mouse and they could actually show that it lives longer and it's also healthier. So, But the question is always, do we want to bring that in the same way to the human? Because if we do it in our whole body, what will happen to our brain? Yeah. We don't know. Um, so that's, that's always the question it is kind of how translatable is it to humans? Would it be something more where you would work on kind of tissue degeneration, so then you take certain tissues that you can rejuvenate or very specific processes, or at, will it become something where you would apply it to the whole organism, which I think is, is a bit more futuristic and we have to see. Yeah, because even now we've never, I mean, it's great what David Sinclair did. I think it opens up a whole new field and it's, it's amazing. Um, and if that could be done in humans, cool. I just, I don't know, no one's ever taken like an old mouse and transformed it into a young mouse, right? No, so they, no, they did it with this reprogramming, they did that a bit, where they took an older mouse and reprogrammed it and it became a bit younger, but it will never become yeah. like a completely young mouse. And it's also logical because some of the processes have already happened, which you cannot rejuvenate yeah. anymore. So you can only rejuvenate part of an organism still. You cannot make it like it was completely young again. You can get rid of some of the effects that, that has, have happened that are that rejuvenation can target, but there will still be potentially some damage, for example, in the, in the DNA. Because if, you, if the damage has occurred in the DNA, you can rejuvenate the organism, but the damage is still exactly, there. Exactly, exactly. So, so now we're, we're just talking about the epigenome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only, I mean, this is only one thing that you do, which you can do to target it, but you will not prevent other processes, aging processes from happening. So this is also the question indeed, how, how much can you actually use it for prevention? Um, because it might be that you rejuvenate, but you still have all the effects there that lead to a certain disease that the rejuvenation doesn't help with, like yeah. DNA damage, for example, or other things. So that's what we, uh, yeah, that's what we don't know. And this is a lot of, work that needs to be done before it's ready for humans even. Yeah, so reversing aging, that's, I mean, if it's even possible, it's yeah. very, very far away because right now there's no evidence really to suggest that we will be able to reverse aging. At the moment, slowing aging should be our target and yeah. I think that potentially possible with, with, with what we are doing, but reversing aging is, no, we are not there yet. And the question is how far we will get with that. Maybe in the future we will be, it will be possible, but at the moment it's, it's not realistic. Mm. Yet that we can do that. Is there like a sweet spot to the, so cause if you wanna like reverse um, the aging of the epigenome, to what point do we wanna reverse it? Cause we don't wanna go all the way back to the pluripotent state. Um, mm -hmm. Cause like we discussed then like, you know, our, our brain wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> Would not act like a brain cell. So is there kind of like a sweet spot that we know of? I, I, I guess people are thinking about it. I, this is, again, not my expertise, okay. but um, I would say, yes, you wouldn't want to go to young. It needs to yeah. be in a state where there is enough, um, um, where there is enough evidence that it, it's, it's the state where you want to start with and not go back to fully young, um, young cells. But where that is, where that sweet spot is, no, I, I wouldn't know that. But um, I mean, we also have to think, okay, when to intervene, right? Like we said, yeah because epigenetic reprogramming 
it's probably not very effective if you start intervening when a person is already 80 and has a lot of things already happening. You might need to work then uh, at an age where before the diseases start to occur that you can still prevent things yeah, from exactly. happening. So the window in which you apply it is also very important. So the window to which you bring it back, but also when you exactly apply it will both be something that needs further study. Yeah. Well, yours, this was an amazing conversation. As always, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, for me, actually talking about like this field is really important, particularly on podcasts, because when I first got into podcasts, it was a podcast that I listened to about, about aging. So I hope that also this podcast will kind of inspire people to listen to more science. I hope so too. I mean, there are, I mean, it's a popular medium in our field. Uh, I know David Sinclair uses a lot, uses it a lot to uh, yeah. to attract people. And if you have new students coming also here, then they always say, "Oh, I got interested because of David Sinclair um, and his research in the podcast." So I think it's a very important way of communicating as well what we are doing yeah. in the field, and also to hear different um, uh, views um, of people in the field, how they think about things. So I always advise people. You can listen to me, but I would definitely also advise to listen to others because they have other opinions and it's good to form a very educated opinion about the field because it's a very um, diverse field where people have many different opinions. And it's growing, and like it's you growing. said, over the last one and a half years, yes, it's grown, it's grown. Yes. a lot. Yes, so I mean, you get more and more different opinions in the field, which I think is very good, but you really should try to find, okay, um, what is the opinion I like better than the other? What is you, you need to get informed because what the problem is a bit in our field is that we have a lot of hype in the field and we need to be careful not to overhype things and sell the wrong message and then make people aware, okay, there are nice things happening in the field which could lead to something that we need to be careful not to hype them so that people outside of the field that just listen to, to it think, oh, we are already there. We, we can already rejuvenate. We can... Um, target aging. No, we are not there yet. We are working on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>